Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Bass. I am the Senior Program Manager of Community Learning at the Greater Twin Cities United Way. Thank you for your time and commitment to the community. 2020 has been very challenging for us all. Today, our hope is that we can play a small role in helping you become a change maker as we move our community forward. But before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping details that we need to cover. Uh, first of all, the session will be recorded, so please put yourself on mute and turn off your video. Uh, the Community Connection Series is designed to inform community stakeholders and community leaders about effective tactics that will allow the community to work effectively together in order to resolve community conflicts, develop initiatives to disrupt systematic inequities, enhance civic identity development, highlight opportunities, and become more empowered to bring about constructive change in our region. Our objective today is to bring you closer to our work by creating the shared deep dive conversation space on pressing community issues that the United Way strategic response can address. We wanna recognize this unique space where we have convened both our donors and community partners. Your presence today is most welcome and appreciated. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat function, which I'll be monitoring. After the panel discussion, when space is presented, then um, I'll announce your question at the time to our speakers. Lastly, engage and have fun. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, first, we have uh, Barty Y, Executive Director of the Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota. Uh, then we have Autumn Way, who's the Chair of the Advocacy Committee of Women's United. Now, let's look at the agenda. So at this time, I'm welcoming you, and then we're gonna transition very soon to focusing on the theme of the power of advocacy. At that time, we're going to then transition to a panel discussion where we'll also have a large group Q&A. We'll conclude that with a call to action and they'll, then I'll come back on to wrap up. But at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the land. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge that these are the traditional ancestral contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. We are on the Dakota lands of the Minnesota Makoche land where the water reflects the sky or cloudy water, the water trees and all living things coming out of the ground carry with them the spirit of the Dakota people because quite literally this ground is saturated with the DNA of the ancestors who live here for a millennia. The land was ceded from the Dakota in the treaties of 1837 and 1851 and we acknowledge the complex and multi-layered history that included violence and trauma. This land continues to hold great historical and spiritual significance and remains sacred for many people. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and the Greater Twin Cities United Way is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for sovereign tribal nations and indigenous peoples of the Minnesota and across the United States. So thank you. Now, without further ado, Kristen Rosenberger will begin the session. Well, thank you, Anthony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Rosenberger, and I'm the Senior Advocacy Manager here at United Way. Uh, I'm just really excited to be with you today and share how we're leveraging advocacy to advance systemic change. But first, I'd like to acknowledge our donors and their generous support that allows us to engage in this meaningful work. Your support of our mission is inspiring, so thank you. Let's go to the next slide here. So let's first talk about what is advocacy. It's, it's one of those small words that represents so much. And each of us has likely joined our call today with a, just a slightly different idea about what advocacy means. Most importantly, advocacy is about taking action to create change. So taking action to create change. So, so actually all of you have already exper are experienced advocates. Um, maybe you've addressed an issue at school with your child's teacher, or you've championed the success of a colleague at work. These are all examples of advocating to make a positive change. And, and so here at United Way, we simply take that up a notch. Um, so we advocate to solve the root problems that create barriers for communities in the first place. Um, we know that these challenges disproportionately impact Black, Indigenous, and people of color, leading to the gaping racial disparities that our state is grappling with today. And I think that the, the COVID-19, um, the murder of George Floyd, have only exacerbated all of those disparities. This is where advocacy comes into play, promoting policy solutions 
that address these inequities. Let's go to the next slide. So United Way has a really strong history of advocating for bipartisan policy change in Minnesota. Through our leadership and coalition partnerships, we've lifted up early care and education as a top priority at the Capitol for over the last decade. And these efforts have led to historic advancements, benefiting thousands of children and their families from low wealth households every year. To further leverage our policy work, we broadened our advocacy to include all three of our impact areas in 2020, which was extremely exciting, and we're already seeing the impacts. Despite the unexpected challenges this year, United Way helped secure several important legislative wins. With the onslaught of COVID-19, we quickly turned to our nonprofit partners to understand what were their evolving needs, what was happening in community in real time. So we couple, coupled their feedback with data from our 211 resource call center. And together, we were able to identify the most pressing needs of our communities and elevate these priorities to lawmakers very quickly during session. And without question, the top issue of concern was to ensure families could remain safely in their homes, despite the many hardships they were facing, um, financial hardships, health hardships due to the pandemic. Our collective efforts resulted in $100 million for housing assistance to help pay for rent and utility expenses. And to support this effort, uh, 211 ramped up extremely quickly, um, was really creative, and partnered with the state to provide a streamlined pre-screening process for applicants. And from what we're seeing, the numbers are absolutely staggering. 211 has fielded over 80,000 calls since the program began in August. 13,000 households have received assistance so far, with over 12,000 applications still being processed. So clearly, we will continue our efforts to meet escalating needs, but not only in housing, but across all of our impact areas. And as always, we'll work across what we call both sides of the aisle, taking a bipartisan approach to solving complex issues. Let's go to the, the next slide here. So I think I, it's really important that not only is it important that we understand what we advocate for, but how we advocate for those issues. As a core value, United Way understands it's vitally important that underserved communities have a voice in the policies that impact their lives. We work to elevate and incorporate community voices in a number of different ways, like partnering with coalitions that are inclusive of a diverse community perspectives. And a great example of this is the Start Early Funders Coalition. Um, we are the fiscal host for that coalition and have been for over a decade. And we launched, a, uh, they just launched a parent and provider advisory community committee, excuse me, just this year, this fall actually. And it honors parents and childcare providers as experts and lifts up their voices to inform both the coalitions and United Way's advocacy priorities. So that is really important. Um, additionally, United Way continues to work closely with its nonprofit partners to co-develop its policy and advocacy um, agendas. Why don't we go to the next slide? So with 95 non nonprofit partners doing amazing work every day, we have a really unique insight to both the immediate and long-term community needs. And our goal is to work together to lift up these issues at the Capitol. So that's why we engaged our stakeholders to directly inform the development of our 2020 policy agenda. Um, after uh, this fall, I would say after session, but session has not ended yet. Um, but after a regular session, we went back and said, OK, it's time to develop next year's agenda. Let's see how did we do? What can we do differently? So based on this year's stakeholder survey results, we learned that over 90 percent of our grantees agreed that our 2020 agenda did reflect the needs and priorities of their organization. So that was extremely positive um, and we'll continue to build that as we go forward. Uh, through the survey, we we're also able to identify key themes and priorities across our impact areas. And we also receive very specific suggestions for policy action, be it something, uh, a new priority or new language, um, creating more specificity in our agenda. So that was extremely valuable information. And we used all of this info to inform our new 2021 advocacy agenda, which is going to be finalized the end of this month by the full board. Let's go to the next slide. 
So as you can see, United Way is uniquely positioned to influence government policy and decision making. And we know that this policy change is critical to solving the root causes of poverty and inequitable outcomes. So just to recap, we do this by amplifying community voices, educating leaders about critical community needs, and co-developing solutions across sectors. So with that, I'd like to move to our, our panelist discussion so that we can highlight a few of our special partnerships and really dig into some examples of how we work together to advance change. So first, it is my pleasure to introduce Barty Wahi. She's the Executive Director of Children's Defense Fund of Minnesota and works tirelessly, and if you know Barty, you know this to be absolutely true, to support thriving children and families. Barty has more than 20 years of experience as a nonprofit advocate and actually worked at United Way for several years leading our education portfolio. So she's, a, she's an insider and, and a great uh, co-partner. It's also my pleasure to introduce Autumn Way. Autumn is the regional president for Wells Fargo and chair of Women United's new, newly launched advocacy committee, which she helped launch this year. So as one of our giving community, communities, Women United is a key partner through their aligned fundraising, their grant making, and now advocacy to support women's financial independence and children's success. So I'd like to just take a second and uh, give a warm welcome to both Barty and Autumn. So to get started, uh, let's get a quick overview for each of your organizations, starting with uh, the Children's Defense Fund, or we might refer to it throughout the conversation as CDF. It's a, a lot easier. Um, so let me turn it over to you, Barty, and why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for that warm introduction. And um, just by way of connection, um, I had the good fortune of getting to work with Women United when I was at CDF and really appreciated the thoughtful um, investment and just like thought leadership around um, how to really help women and children. So um, just uh, I'm so glad to be uh, here with you all today. So the Children's Defense Fund is a policy and advocacy as well as a youth development organization. Um, uh, our mission is to really ensure that children and youth have the best start possible um, as they uh, they make their way through childhood and young adulthood um, uh, with a caring community around them. We being the caring community. Um, we do this work um, in a whole host of ways um, through legislative advocacy and administrative advocacy through research and um, policy and data analysis, through community organizing and outreach, and then again, through youth development, particularly um, uh, uh, working with um, out of school, uh, young people and children in out of school time settings, and then also with our scholarship program. Um, CDF is particularly concerned, I think, with um, overall child well-being here in the state of Minnesota, but I think paying particular attention to those um, children who have uh, been the most under-resourced and uh, the most overburdened by our system. So really focusing on children who are living in low-income households, as well as um, Black, Brown, and Indigenous children, knowing that systemic uh, racism and inequity uh, lands heavily, and we can see that through disparities. So that is the nature of our work, and i um, very happy to be here today to talk about advocacy. Great. Thanks so much, Barty. And it's clear that your organization's leading some incredibly important work and some very, um, you know, long held but long needed efforts as well. So thank you. Um, well, why don't we move to the next slide and uh, love to get Autumn to share a little bit more about what Women United is. I think that could be new to a lot of folks here today. Uh let me unmute. Um, well, thanks, Kristen, for having me here today. And um, yeah, so Women United is um, it's one of three of the giving communities, and we have about thirteen hundred women that have become members. Um, and we basically are a group of women that um, want to, in a sense, pull the money that we donate to the United Way together with um, a focus on women, financial stability and early childhood education. And so um, we have a biannual grantee process where we um, accept applications from a number of 
uh, organizations that support these causes specifically. And we go through the whole process. We determine how much money we're given to each organization based on the amount of money that we have funded. And um, we meet with these organizations to understand um, what their needs are, how they're going to use the money that we are su supporting them with, and um, really want to make sure that we are innovative in how we do that. Um, we also have just a really great community of opportunities to engage with each other through volunteer events. Um, I personally started as um, leading a, um, an evening to educate people at Wells Fargo about Women United and um, why it would be um, advantageous for them to join us in the work that we're doing. And so there's a lot of different ways to participate, but um, mostly it's a community of women that just care about helping other women, helping children. And um, we come together to find ways to do that with some specific organizations. So. Thank you, Autumn. I think Women United, United offers um, just a unique and another important way to advance our collective mission. And so I appreciate your comments. Um, why don't we move on to dig deeper into what advocacy really looks like in action. <laughs> That's the fun part. Um, so Barty, why don't I tee up the first question here to you. Um, so you just shared a bit about the work of CDF and how advocacy is a really important and one of your important levers that's interconnected across all of the kinds of work that you do. Um, so can you just talk a little bit more uh, why advocacy is impor important to initiate transformational change in the work that you're trying to accomplish? Oh, sure. Um, you know, I think that uh, one thing that's sort of important to sort of note about CDF is that um, uh, I think that for us, uh, we push on the lever of advocacy and um, uh, in order to create systems change. Um, it, you know, despite, uh, you know, data and there's really um, and the disparities. Our disparities exist not because um, there's anything wrong with our children and our babies. It exists because systems have just not been able. We haven't we don't have systems that are working for them. Right. And we have families that are um, are, are living in the margin, um, overburdened, certainly. And so I, I guess I think for us at CDF, we do advocacy work because we believe that um, while direct service is um, incredibly important and we are ourselves direct service providers in the area of youth development, we really believe that there is an opportunity to take um, to really uh, both connect a community to policymakers and change makers in order to to really drive solutions that work for everybody here in the state, not just some. And I think that that is why we have chosen policy and advocacy work as a critical way um, to, to move to transform uh, transformational change. Yeah, thanks, Barty. And I know you have and I have had many conversations. Um, we've worked together for, for years um, in our advocacy, starting with early childhood and the Mini Minds um, Coalition. And I know some of our discussions was about how systems are really um, built to help people in crisis, but not necessarily help them out um, into uh, financial independence and certainly wealth building. And I think that's where um, all of our organizations have a mission to create pathways toward prosperity, towards financial independence and wealth building. Um, and so we really need to work on systems providing those pipelines as well. Um, so thank you. So Autumn, uh, Women United's created impact through its grant making. I think you talked about that already, which is, is really interesting to support your mission. Um, and that's included over the years engagement with, uh, as I was just mentioning, Mini Minds and the Start Early Funders Coalition um, to increase awareness and information around the need for early childhood investments. Um, so why didn't Women United just take that like next step to get directly involved in policy work? and launch an advocacy committee this year. And then how does this advocacy complement your mission to empower women and families through a two generation approach? Yeah, so, um, well, I think why it, in my mind is, um, it's about solving root issues and not um, just having funding go to organizations to help the need now. And I feel like the funding is kind of like a band-aid to solve immediate issues, whereas um, the advocacy work is where you create change 
um, that will be a sustainable way to truly change the issues that are causing the needs for these organizations. And so um, the United Way, which I, I didn't know this until um, this committee was formed, but the United Way is already doing a lot of work, as you spoke about in the advocacy space. And um, and we're, we're a group of women that are pretty passionate about the organizations we're supporting. And our goal is to truly make change. And so when the opportunity came to um, kind of build off what the United Way is doing from an advocacy perspective, and find ways to do similar work that is going to change um, the, the areas that, that are important to us so that we can hopefully begin to solve the issues and not just be repairing it or um, just kind of in the moment fixing things. I think from a two generational approach, um, I'm originally from LA area. And when I moved out here in 2014, I, I kept hearing about this um, early childhood education gap. And obviously if um, the parents and a lot of times the women uh, are, are single moms, if they're not financially stable, we know already the kids are gonna have a rough start at um, trying to have a successful life through childhood. And so in my mind, it was really hard for me to understand how a community like the Twin Cities, which is amazing and they're a community that comes together and cares about the issues, how we would have this issue around the childhood education gap. And so I think for me and the women on the advocacy committee, we know that it's possible here. I, I believe that it's possible to truly um, affect the root issues. We just gotta make sure that we are going to the right people and having the right kinds of conversations so that we can educate the um, those in elected positions and help us to make change so that we're um, positively affecting both the women that are in poverty as well as ultimately having that trickle down to the children as well, which is um, the, the reason why Women United exists. That's what we wanna continue to solve and, and put things in place to prevent from happening in the future. Yeah, so important. Thank you. Um, bouncing back to Barty here. Uh, so when we talk about advocacy, some people immediately think it it's sort of a synonym of lobbying. Um, but really, that's just one tool that can be employed to advocate for an issue. So what does advocacy look like for your organization? And for example, what might be specific examples or kinds of activities that your organization engages in? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, advocacy is a much broader set of activities. Um, and I think that, at, you know, at the root, um, they uh, advocacy is really about helping to educate people who may not fully understand um, the issue itself, who is impacted, what at, what what different types of solutions might exist to, to address the root cause, as uh, Autumn was just stating. Um, it, I think it, 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 and then it is about trying to sort of influence a little bit, right? And some of that is about lobbying. Some of that is about um, trying to influence the people in the community to take action in a certain kind of way. And so it really is sort of a both and. And I think that for us, um, some of the specific activities that we engage in are just a lot of community education around certain issues. Um, uh, I think that we spend a lot of time looking at data because we think that that is a critical component of, of uh, policy making. Um, uh, data is really important to as a, a key aspect of understanding the problem. Um, for us, it has also really included um, uh, really community organizing and community uh, leadership support. Um, I, I think that those uh, that are oftentimes most impacted by policies don't often have a say in what those policies are like. And, and, um, and, and sometimes our policymakers have very little understanding of the issue of, of, of poverty, of economic insecurity, of like the scramble to find childcare. Um, I feel like some, many of you might all understand that, but there are a lot of people who don't understand that. And so I also think that it is about the cre creating a bridge between the community and those who have decision-making um, so that there is greater proximity on the issue and, and the problem and, and, and the consequences and how that's felt. Um, I also think that it is about leadership development. 
because there are a lot of amazing folks in communities who should be maybe the decision makers and the policy makers themselves. So it's about, I think, also really helping community identify the skills and their own power um, to create influence and change. Just as Women United is sort of taking up their own power in this space, um, uh, I think that that's a, an important component um, uh, of our advocacy efforts. And then there's just lobbying. There's like drafting bills, there's like, right? But to be honest with you, that is actually probably the what we spend the least amount of our time, particularly as a, a, a C3 entity, um, and more about sort of like, what is the policy development? What is the vision we have so that all families have the appropriate childcare they need? Or what does the, what broadly does economic security mean for families? Is it wages? Is it a combination of wages and different benefit types that support economic security in the long haul? Um, and so I think that those are all the activities that we engage in. And there's so many ways for people to plug in in all of those places. Um, it doesn't require a lobbyist to, I think, have um, to own their own authority and power and try to have influence with um, with policymakers at every level, the legislature, city council, um, uh, county commissioners, school boards. There's all, all kinds of spaces to do that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know some of, and then initially you talked a little bit about uh, data, you know, and that comes back to sort of that head in the heart concept, right? We really need to educate people about what those issues are, what those needs are, what's actually happening in their community that they may be completely um, unknowledgeable about, but then we have to make them care about that data. And so I think that, that that's a great point. And we'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, engaging community as well in a minute. Um, let's move over to you, Autumn. You know, I think what's really fun and interesting about your work is is Women United launched their advocacy committee basically in 2020. So that was interesting. <laughs> and so we all kind of held on. Um, but I think that I love that you know, folks that aren't really engaged in advocacy, but really care about making change, are willing to get uncomfortable or willing to open their minds and really learn about what is advocacy, we're open to ideas and let's roll up our sleeves and get, you know, get going. So what has advocacy maybe looked like for your committee? Um, or, or what do you see maybe how you'd like to engage going into the 2021 session? Yeah, um, so yeah. Absolutely. First of all, I'll say that um, I'm passionate about empowering women and, and, and helping with the childhood education gap. I don't personally have children, but um, the advocacy piece was definitely a place where um, I have zero experience in prior to this committee. Um, but I, again, it comes back to what I believe is possible here in the Twin Cities. I think we have a, we have people here that care so deeply about our communities that we can figure out ways to really start to solve the root issues. And I may not be an expert and, um, and you know, Kristen, when you shared with us that, you know, our elected officials wanna speak to us, I just, you know, that kind of blew me away because I thought, I, I don't even know what I would say to them, but as somebody that is passionate about the causes I can just talk about that and I could talk about the information, the data that's being given to me from um, from United Way, Women United. I can talk about the women that we have helped. Right. And the women that have been they've benefited them and their children from the nonprofit organizations that we're supporting and take it a step further, where whether it's educating my networks, it's talking to other people about um, not just giving, but understanding that that what the United Way and Women United is trying to do is go beyond just funding organizations and funding projects. It's really trying to fix the root issue. And um, we had one of the very first meetings we had, you brought in a speaker and she talked about this, and I think Barty will talk about it, but the, the, the benefits cliff of if I get a promotion, I'm going to lose some of the benefits that I've been getting. And I need, I need, I want more money. I need more money. And I, so there's like this push and pull and tug that to me is just heartbreaking. And so 
from an advocacy perspective for us so far, it's been, we've signed some petitions that has been really easy as you brought things to our attention. Um, we would have been at Children's Day at the Capitol where, you know, we go and, and I think about that as just a large group of people cre illuminating that there's a lot of people that care about this cause. I may not have all the answers or know what questions to say, but I wanna be a part of the visual that there's a lot of people that care about this. And we want you to hear from uh, the people that have all the facts and the data so that we can help come together for a solution. So I think it's early on and what Women United is gonna be doing. It's early on for me, certainly, but. I'm finding myself getting more comfortable having conversations that I don't totally know the answer about, but I can communicate how the need is and how important it is to me that I help be a part of that. Yeah, and I think that's so powerful. And, and both you and Barty, I think, talked about how advocacy isn't one just one thing. There's so many ways, big and small, that we can all engage in and together uh, those efforts become really powerful. So I really appreciate that insight. Um, so Barty, uh, you know, you you mentioned how important it is, and, and we talked about it, I talked about it a little bit earlier, it's how important is United Way, um, that we use our position and power as organizations to engage the perspective of those most impacted, um, that they're a part of the policymaking process, right, from the very get-go. Um, they're the experts. So. Can you share some examples how CDF has lifted up those most impacted um, by the systems and policies um, that create barriers for them? And why is this so important to how, again, how you show up and do your work? Um, sure, and as I said, Envoy Autumn, that was really inspiring. It, um, uh, you know, I think that um, there is a lot of power and knowledge that lives with all of us, right? including folks that have been marginalized. They actually know their situation better than than many other people do. And, you know, I think one of the challenge many of us have seen in policy making has been, um, you know, so different solutions are tried and they're not, you know, they don't work or they don't really take into account all of uh, the benefits clip is a primary example of like a set of policies that are are meant to help and in some ways do and then also have unintended consequences and perhaps if anyone had actually really talked to to families they might understand that better and and create you know and, and make some changes um but you know i think that uh for cdf i think that there are two ways we do this i think first and foremost it is important for us as pol as advocates right and as as policy wonks or whatever you know we are um to uh, that we are in communication and we are in community right that, that our work is being um, informed and led and driven by community and their lived experience, right? So uh, for example, it, it might be easy for me to speak about the issue of broadband um, in the time of COVID, but I think it's much more important for me to understand what that's like for somebody living in a rural space where broadband is absolutely inaccessible and what does distance learning mean, right? So I think for us, it is important, um, just first and foremost, that we are walking that walk, that 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 our own work is informed by community and in and, and, and in community. Um, I think the second thing is how do we create the shortest bridge possible between our community between communities most impacted? Because we do have the 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 connective tissue and the and the bridge infrastructure to policymakers in a way that many don't and how can we how can we leverage our own position and work to be that strong bridge so for example um about i want to say five years ago um when my predecessor who is now the lieutenant governor um peggy flanagan was in my seat and i was actually with Kristen in her, at cd or at united way um uh there were a group of us working with uh cdf at the time identify how could community be more involved in the policy making process and through a whole bunch of listening and community partnership and development we landed on a policy strategy called community solutions fund and that policy was really about if we want to impact child well-being why not allow communities to define the strategy right that they would like they think has the most impact right so uh, I'll give you an example, um, uh, but like, let's say you wanna influence third grade reading, maybe it's through housing, 
in housing stability and investment. That's not oftentimes how we invest in third grade reading, but wouldn't it be interesting? So how could we allow community to identify those things? And it was really from those community conversations. And I think the demand of the community like, hey, CDF, put your money where your mouth is and like really think about community investment. And so it took us a while. Policy work is not quick sometimes. And um, but really over the course of five years, worked to really to refine, created that bridge between community and policymakers and were able to pass that. And so that's an example of where it influenced us as a, an organization. And then it really drove a, a policy strategy that got uh, in 2019, got in, uh, received investment and appropriation. Yeah, I think that's just so important that we we keep that in mind and really activate on that. So thanks, Barty. Um, so let's go to our last kind of formal panel discussion uh, here. So I'll tee up uh, the same question to both you um, and Autumn. But in the meantime, uh, for those of you today, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat so we can tee up. We'd love to have uh, a group discussion and answer what you're curious about, what your questions are. So go ahead and th start throwing uh, questions into the chat and we'll go to our last question. So I'll tee that up to you first, Autumn. So, um, you know, as we've talked, United Way is really uniquely positioned to bring people and organizations together to foster new solutions and, of course, work in partnerships. So can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that your organization has partnered with United Way to advance common advocacy goals? And, and maybe um, it's a little soon, but, you know, how do you feel that this partnership um, maybe could play an important role in the outcomes and impacts uh, of your work down the road? Yeah, so um, I think first and foremost, the way that we're partnering with United Way is the fact that there is advocacy work happening that can help us. It can give us um, resources, tools, where do we go, where can we plug in easily? Um, and so to me, just forming an advocacy committee and having women that um, have shown up every meeting <laughs> during COVID and, um, and none of us are in policy, right? but we care. And so just giving um, giving us an opportunity to take the passion and truly take the money. We all give at least a thousand dollars to be part of the United, you know, the Women United group to be able to influence where that money goes. And then a step further, which I talked about earlier, of how do we be a part of the root solution, right? So that's the first thing. And I, I think it's exciting um, for those of us who maybe have not played in this space around policy and advocacy because we're we're learning and we're growing and, and like, this is a big part of me and my professional development and and learning um how to be even more of an impact influencer in the community the other thing i'll say is um you know when we are doing our grant writing process we go to the organizations and then we we do site visits and we meet with these organizations to understand what their needs are so that we are truly, you know, kind of like Barty was talking about going to the community. Well, if they're going to the community and we're going to them, it's just continuing to bridge and raise up the issues that we can then influence United Way possibly to make an impact on. Um, we can then influence our networks and those kinds of things to understand the work that's happening. And so I think like in, with COVID, we met quickly um, and went back to those organizations and we were able to vote and decide we're going to take the funds which we had specifically kind of guided them or directed them and we just allowed them to use it for general operating because that's what they needed right now. And so the, the, the amount of time we actually connect with the organizations that we're giving grants to, it just really gives us an opportunity to influence up, influence our peers and help to make some, you know, be a part of those solutions, so. Thanks, Autumn. And I, th I think one word that, that keeps floating up from, from all of us is the word influence. Um, influence, awareness, and how much we can do to really share what the needs are, what we care about within our own networks, whether they be formal, professional networks, personal networks, um, or in our community. So I think that's really important. Um, Barty, I'd like 
the same question to you before we go to questions. Um, so I think we've got maybe one or two questions in the chat, but it sounds like folks are shy. So uh, jump in there, please. Um, we'd love to make sure you walk away saying, you know, your question, whatever that might have been, was answered. Barty, are you good with the question or, or would you like me to restate it for you? No, I, I think I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, sure. um, you know, I think that the, I, I mean, I think that um, none of us makes policy change alone. That just doesn't, have, it doesn't matter if you're a policy advocacy organization, whether you are, you know, an individual, uh, whether you're an individual policy maker yourself, like not much happens alone. And so I think that um, where I think when we have partnered with United Way, it is about how we have brought our different networks, our different existing relationships, our different resources to the table to make uh, change for that kind of common vision. And so when we have partnered with United Way, it has oftentimes, and, and the Start Early Funders Coalition and others, it is really around aligned contribution right, that we are creating a, a line up contribution because none of us can do this alone. I have different relationships than those that United Way has, that folks in the community have. And so I, I guess I would just say, I, I, this is, I, and I think that um, United Way is both um, an excellent partner and can be an excellent convener on these issues, right? Um, you know, uh, there is a role for philanthropy and women united in this because, uh, you know, uh, that gets a kind of audience with certain folks. There are roles for policy wonks. There are roles for parents and children. And, and it really takes all of us working together to be able to make transformational change and to do it well. Right. Um, so I think that would just be what I would add. And, and that is the way that we have partnered, I think, to great effect with I, I'm not even going to like. Kristen at one point intimated we've worked together for years <laughs> and I was like and she's not wrong right but I think that those are the kinds of relationships that are important and have appreciated United Way um, in that partnership and relationship building. Great thanks Barty. Um, Anthony I'm gonna turn to you and see sure. uh, what questions we might have coming in through the chat we can tee up. Sure we have a, a question from a guest that asks it says can you speak more about how to promote bipartisan support for a policy change. See, it said that seems the most difficult part of a policy change to me. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Barty or Autumn, would you like care to comment on that? I'm, I'm happy to jump in as well. Well, I, I can just say from, I'll tell you from my, like for me, what, that would be about educating the people in my networks, right? Because um, whether you, <laughs> regardless of your political affiliation, there's certain things that are gonna be important to you. And and I tend to surround myself with people that care about the sim similar things that I do. And so whether they're Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever, if we care about causes and we both understand that we have an opportunity to make change, that to me is how I'm advocating. That's how I'm influencing. And so it's about helping people understand the need and the role that they can play in making a difference, regardless of how they align politically. Thanks. Uh, Barty? Uh, uh, thank you, Adam. Um, I feel like your answer was uh, really hopeful. I might be less hopeful. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm just kidding. No, but I know it's hard. Like um, uh, I, I, to the person who asked the question, like absolutely. I think this is sort of the toughest part of the job, but it's not impossible. And again, I'm going to come back to the, the like to align contribution, right? There are, are different people who are going to hear different messages in different from different messengers, right? And so it is about creating, I, I'm going to use childcare. I'll try to use a specific example. I think childcare, whether you are, are, are living in a low income household to people who actually have resources still struggle with childcare. It's tough. It's tough to find quality spaces. There's always the, the hesitation you have. And so childcare, despite sort of like an early, like had waves, but I think that there is um, I think bipartisan support because it's an issue that impacts everybody, right? Across the political, whatever one's political ideology, like who's gonna watch my kid because I gotta go to work is re real for a lot of people, right? And so I do think it is about, like when you're thinking about bipartisan support and advocacy, it is about leveraging all of the relationships. 
So who in, who on one side of the aisle will hear a certain message and who are the right messengers? It might not be me, but it could be United Way, right? And then on the other side of the aisle, it could be me and maybe not United Way. So I think it is really about how do you leverage the strengths of all of the people? And that requires broad coalition. And that is also in and of itself kind of hard, challenging work. But I mean, that's really how you make transformational change. Yeah, absolutely. And and from a United Way perspective, you know, we always um, approach every issue as a bipartisan issue. I think, um, you know, we're really talking about helping community and common vision. And sometimes there is difference in opinion of how we get there. But what we do is really make sure that people understand what it is that we need to, what's the issue that we need to tackle. And uh, what we get is great agreement. And I'll get, just give an example. I was just on a call this morning with uh, the House Minority Leader, Kurt Doubt, and he's absolutely, you know, Barty, to your point, saying, yes, we need to talk about uh, childcare. It's a major issue. We're hearing that healthcare workers can't go to work because we don't have enough childcare right now, right? And so I was on a, and then we were earlier on a call with, uh, you know, other folks, Melissa Hortman, the Speaker of the House, uh, from the other side of the aisle saying, absolutely, we need to be talking about ch child care and making sure we're propping that up, not only from an educational standpoint and, and a development standpoint for those children, but also as an employment issue, as a workforce issue, an economic development issue. So we really try and bring people together. And even though there's a difference sometimes in how we get there, I think that commonality really helps us get to um, get these issues on the table and start really thinking more deeply about them. Um, Anthony, I'm going to turn it over to I you. Will, I think you've got... Oh, thing, can I just jump in? And the yeah. one nice thing, the one thing that we can hold as not in that sort of partisan space is we can hold the reality of our community. We're not looking at it from a partisan lens. We're looking at it like, what is the real need? And that's actually the value that we bring to the conversation, right? So that's, I typically think, the positive, really positive part of it. And, and I think, too, that that's where bringing, um, elevating voices and bringing people with lived experience into the capital, into the process, into these conversations is so important. It's not a political issue. It's a quality of life issue. It's an economic issue. Um, Anthony, you want to uh, see what other questions there are? Sure, yeah. Uh, the next question asks, uh, do you do specific advocacy work with all of the Greater Twin Cities United Way initiatives, for example, Career Academies and 211? Um, ask that again, who, who is the, uh, I'm not sure if I know the question, is that to Barty and? Um, sure, was this a general, I think it was a general question to all the panelists regarding does the Greater Twin Cities United Way advocate or focus on initiatives in all of our bucket areas? And she gave a couple of examples. One was Career Academies, the other one was 211. Uh, okay, um, I if, if I'm reading that right, I think it's talking about perhaps our uh, policy and advocacy agenda. So we do uh, address and tackle issues across all of our impact areas. Um, it's not always specific to initiatives, and sometimes um, our initiatives will be used as feeders to developing future policies. So it might be a, a place where we're learning about what are the issues, what are the levers, what are the policy plays, and in the future, you know, is this something we can get involved in? So um, you'll see when when our policy agenda comes out, um, we really talk about all of those issues um, somewhere in the agenda, um, as well as 211. Uh, I'm hearing rumor that there could be a federal COVID package coming out, dot, 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 right? We've been hearing that for a while. It seems like we might be getting there. Um, and, and there could be some dollars for 211. I think that this, unfortunately, this pandemic has really elevated the importance and the real-time data that we can get from 211, as well as how important they are to connecting community quickly and effectively to the resources they, that they need today, right? Not next session, not in March, like now. And so, um, you know, absolutely, we're seeing some efforts around um, and supporting efforts around getting that uh, some additional funding and attention. I don't know, Barty or Autumn, uh, if you'd want to say anything to any of that or we might move to one last quick question. The, the only thing that I would add is that United Way's impact areas of economic security uh, for all, but for women, for early childhood, for uh, workforce development are all issues. I mean, they are foundational safety net um, supports, right? 
And so I think that um, there's certainly the work that uh, United Way is doing, but many of the United Way grantees are also partners of ours as we are trying to elevate, like actually what does child poverty look like, right? Um, you know, if you're living, you know, in, in, in Minneapolis or if you're living in uh, Morristown, Minnesota. So I guess I would just say that a lot of these issues are also issues that we are, are, are very interested in as, as a policy organization who's trying to create pathways to prosperity as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I think also that these are all very, very interconnected issues. Um, you know, housing isn't separate from education. That's not separate from job security and pipelines and retraining and certifications, right? So those things all play and are interwoven with when you talk about a family or an individual. So uh, we're really trying to advance that interconnectedness. So I appreciate, you know, that comment. Um, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. We might need to move on, um, Anthony. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide and maybe uh, kind of wrap up. But I just, while we're doing that, um, you know, I just really appreciate all of, you know, your great thinking and all of your um, amazing insights that we've, we've talked about. So I really want to say a special thank you to Barty and Autumn for sharing your inspirational work for us with us today. Um, and certainly um, just very inspired by your continued partnership. So thank you both so much for joining us today. So uh, let's go to the thank you. We'll get the next slide going here. So as we reflect on our conversation today, oh, nope, the one back, sorry. Um, so as we reflect on our conversation today, it's important that we continue to ground ourselves in the voices of those most impacted. And that's why I'd like to uh, share Trenicia's story with you. Um, Trenicia is a really strong, optimistic, uh, professional mother of two children. And when her daughter, Danae, was born, she suffered brain damage and hearing loss due to unexpected complications. Surrounded by her family and a team of specialists, Danae received services to meet her needs, including home visiting to provide additional supports at home. And then when Trenicia went back to work, her daughter received an early learning scholarship to attend a high quality childhood program. Today, uh, Danae is a thriving third grader. She's actually en enrolled in a French immersion school. And Trenicia was so inspired by her daughter's success that she became a parent advocate. And her goal is to really help more families have access to the supports that were so important to her and Danae and make sure parent voices are heard at the Capitol. Um, um, and so I think it's really important that she's understanding that um, United Way was really critical and advocating for the home visiting, for the scholarships. And so Trenicia um, connected with the United Way and we really became close partners in our advocacy and she's really been a rock star ever since. Um, so some of the things that she's done, she's testified at the legislature at their hearings. She's spoken at advocacy events and rallies, and she's even authored several articles to share her story, and really a call to action. I think she's really passionate about encouraging other individuals, other parents to get involved, um, saying, hey, you don't have to be the expert, the professional, but as parents, we are experts at what we need. We're experts at what our ch children need, and we need to go to the Capitol and make our voices heard. So it's been really an honor to work with Trenicia, who shares her words of inspiration. And she says, Danae's start to life gives me strength every day, and I'm thankful for the support we received. However, still in need, so we've got work to do. So true. Let's go to the next slide. So United Way continues to partner with parents like Tunisia and organizations like CDF and Women United to amplify our collective voice at the Capitol um, and amplify the voices of those with lived experiences like Tunisia. Um, our work next session uh, will focus on issues like stable housing, the prevention of homelessness, eviction reform, early childhood, food security, and building pathways to economic independence. So I encourage all of you to keep watch for our new policy agenda, which we'll share when the 2021 legislative session begins on January 5th. Um, it's starting very quickly. We have one more special session um, that's gonna be on Monday with the current legislative caucuses, and then um, they'll swear in the new members and we'll get rocking and rolling in early January. 
Let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, I think, I'm sorry. I think let's go back one slide. So let's become a change maker. And I really wanted to invite you to sign up as a member of our advocacy network. Um, you'll receive updates about our policy efforts, get alerts to advocate alongside United Way during the legislative session. And all you need to do is go to our website at gtcuw.org forward slash advocate um, and just sign up and you'll get some information and you know we hope that you'll join us so we can advocate together it will make it simple we'll make it easy um, you know we'll try not to give you too much you know continued information but really keep you looped in and how can you join our voice and align um, our collective action at the capitol so remember we create change through the power of advocacy and uh, I hope you've been inspired by Barty and and Autumn and their amazing work that they do today. So I'd like to turn it back to Anthony to provide closing comments. Thank you Kristen, panelists, staff, donors and community leaders. Uh, a video of today's link, uh, uh, excuse me, a video of today's session will be included in our newsletter that is sent out monthly. Our next CUNY Connection Series event will be our 2021 kickoff event, which will be January 21st. So I'd like to end this session with a, a commitment to live inclusively. I commit to live, I commit to being intentional and living inclusively. I commit to spending more time getting to know myself and understanding my culture. It is in understanding myself that I am better positioned to understand others. I will acknowledge I don't know what I don't know, but I will not use what is unconscious as an excuse. I will be intentional exposing myself to difference. If I don't know, I will ask. If I'm asked, I will assume positive intent. Most importantly, I will accept my responsibility, increasing my own knowledge and understanding. I commit to speaking up and speaking out, even when I'm not directly impacted, for there is no such thing as neutrality in the quest for equity, justice, and inclusion. I will strive to accept, just not tolerate, respect even if I don't agree, and be curious, not judgmental. I commit to pausing and listening. I will be empathetic to the experiences and perspective of my others. I will use my privilege positively and get comfortable with my own discomfort. I commit to knowing, getting, and doing better than I did yesterday. Keeping in mind my commitment to live inclusively is a journey and not a destination. Thank you all and have a great day.